So here we have the spreading of the heavens indicated with the chart, and that's astrophysics. Now in chapter 10, verse 6 of this marvelous reflective book of Job, we have, Thine hands have made me and fashioned me, not only made me by giving me life, but fashioned me in a special dimension. This is the science of life origins reflected in the book of Job. I think we need to spend more time reading that book and contemplating on that book and realizing that there is a fabric, a matrix of scientific data underlying it all. Then in chapter 13, verse 23, we have a problem of psychology or the science of psychology. You know my transgressions. You know, we're all sinners. But in psychology, we evaluate the impact of our violations of our own conscience, violation of our own standards and the standards of society. So here we have uh, an emphasis not only of mentioning that we're transgressors, but tabulation. You know my transgressions. In chapter 14, verse 14, we have a philosophical inquiry. If a man die, shall he live again? I've mentioned a number of times on this broadcast that in the philosophy departments at all the major universities, there are four questions that are asked. Who am I? Where did I come from? What's my purpose here? And where am I going? These questions are reflected in the book of Job. Job is probably the oldest, chronologically, the oldest book of the Bible. Genesis takes us further into the past, but Job was probably written even before the book of Genesis, written by Moses. The book of Job reflects on the mind of man closer to creation, able to think with greater perspicuity. that is a, a clearer direction of concentration, and able to communicate with his creator. So in Job chapter 14, verse 14, if a man die, shall he live again? The question is asked. But then, in chapter 23, verse 3, oh, that I knew where I might find him. That is the science of theology. Theology is the queen of sciences. Physics is the king of sciences. But theology cannot be ignored in scientific inquiry. It is a systematic analysis. Socrates said, if I found virtue, I'd fall at his feet and worship him. Plato said, we look for a God or a God-inspired man who can take the mist from our eyes and show us the way home. And then Job said, oh, that I knew where I might find him. Well, in this book of Job, he ultimately says, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And at the latter day, he'll stand and I'll stand on the earth. Meaning, but after paying the price of redemption, the resurrection was true, which means that my resurrection will be true. In these closing moments, chapter 26, verse 7 refers to stretching out the north over the empty space. And he hangeth the earth upon nothing. All in verse 7 of chapter 26. That has to do with the science of astronomy and the science of gravitational attraction. So we have stretching out over the north space, the heavens over the north space. There actually has been found a space with no stars, visible at least. So again, a marvelous and incredible scientific statement in the book of Job having to do with astronomy. Chapter 28, verse 25 refers to a weight of the wind. That's the science of meteorology. In those days, until just decades ago, a few centuries ago at best, scientists had no idea that atmosphere had weight to it. Literally, the book of Job anticipates all of these sciences. And then in 38 verse 7, the morning stars sang together. That's radio astronomy. It's been discovered in the last few decades that there are pulsars in deep space actually emitting signals detectable, digitized signals detectable to our plasmic receptors. Chapter 38, verse 22, refers to the treasures of the snow. This is the science of nutritional benefit. 
Chapter 40, verses 15 through 24, refer to the great behemoth, the great dinosaur that Professor Zimmerman uh, pointed to a short while ago. Chapter 41, verses 1 through 34, refer to Leviathan. Leviathan had six chemical components to his body, including actual compartments that gave him the ability to breathe fire. A supply of oxygen, controlled humidity, airtight chambers, a supply a medium for friction, and sulfur and phosphorus. If you combine those conditions and elements, you have a controlled fire. I'm saying that the oldest book of the Bible and the rest of the books of the Bible have a matrix, an interlapping fabric of scientific data far in advance of the scholars of its day, and it claims to be divinely inspired. The most wonderful thing about it, in fulfillment of that claim, is that it shows that if a man die, he can live again. That God has solved the problem of redemption. Jesus Christ, his son, came, walked our streets, sat in our councils, went to Calvary, shed his blood, died for us, was buried, rose again, and right now is knocking at your heart's door. Would you pray this simple prayer? Lord Jesus, thank you for solving my greatest problem. Thank you for dying for me. I want you in my heart. I want your blood to cover my sins. Lord Jesus, right now, at this moment, right now, I open my heart to you. Come into my heart and save me, and I'll serve you with all my heart. If you prayed that simple prayer, you have the God of the universe living within you, and life is a road to heaven. in the 21st century has been sponsored by Trinity Broadcasting Network. And only with your love gift of support can this program stay on the air. So write to Creation in the 21st Century, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Creation in the 21st Century is a unique program on TBN combining biblical knowledge with scientific verification. Much of the information that I use on the program is available. Contact us. Just write Creation Evidence Museum, P.O. Box 309, Glen Rose, Texas, 76043, or call us at 254-897-3200. We look forward to hearing from you today.